was the raising up of the booth of David. And you know that booth in Hebrew also means tabernacle. It also means sukkah. It's the, it's the word that kind of embraces all those thoughts. So verse 11 says, In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David. In that day means future tense. And wall up its breaches. That means to fill in all the gaps that are all the holes that are um, found in it. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Speaking of a time in the future, this is Amos' time, this is post-Davidic, this is after David. He says, David's tabernacle has fallen. David's tabernacle was the place of worship that was different than the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. Remember, the, the tabernacle of, of Moses in the wilderness was very strict worship. The priests had to do things exactly the perfect way with exactly the right attire on, etc., etc., and only certain people could enter in. And then by the time that David had his tabernacle in the wilderness, David instituted a new kind of worship in which everyone could worship. And you remember that the t intensity of the worship, even in David's own personal life, there was one time when he was dancing before the Ark of the Covenant, bringing it back uh, to its rightful place, where he was dancing, he took his clothes off, and he was dancing with all his might before the processional because of the Ark of the Lord. And this is the kind of worship, this freedom and this expression of the Holy Spirit, spirit-led worship, or prophetic worship, if you will, that David undertook. So it was different than Moses. It was different than Israel. And David instituted that. But the, that tabernacle of David fell. The booth of David fell. And the Lord said, I want that back. I want that kind of worship back. That was not the Mosaic version where you would have to be regimented in your worship, that it would have to be for certain people only. He says, I want to do this for all the nations, even the Edomites, which in those days were the biggest enemies of Israel. He says, the Edomites and then all of the nations are going to experience the result of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal picture of what the Lord's heart is in worship and what he really wants and really wants to see. In Acts chapter 15, you fast forward to the New Testament and you find this statement made. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. See, he's referring to Amos there. After these things, I will return. And I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, in order that the rest of, the man, of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles also, who are called by my name. He was referring to the fact that this is the time that that door has been opened. The last days, the beginning of the church age, in the last days, the Lord wants to restore and rebuild the tabernacle of David so all the nations, including us Italians and the Germans and, and the English and all the rest are enjoying the freedom of the worship that is inherent in the tabernacle of David. So it's very important that we understand that God wants to do something in the restoration of worship. And he doesn't want worship to be kind of like regimented and, and stale and old. David's worship in his tabernacle was exciting, and the presence of the Lord was there in a, in a kind of anointing that literally would stop the priests from being able to minister. Just powerful worship. Worship in itself, um, I just want to give a very quick definition because I think I'm preaching to the choir mostly here. 
Worship is honor and adoration directed to God. When you adore someone, when you adore someone, you really ascribe a value to them. You really love them. Um, Doria is a Greek word, by the way, which we get the word adoration from. And Doria actually means a gift. This is a strange thing. When you look at the word adoration and you see the word Doria in there, there's, there's kind of several words for gifts. Charisma is a word for gift as well. But this is emphasis on, on the, the person who is giving it, not the gift itself. Doria, so when you adore someone, you are literally taking something from yourself and offering it to that person. Worship is not only honor to the Lord and respect and the fear of the Lord, but it also has a form of adoration in it as well, in which you present yourself as a gift to the Lord. You say, I love you so much, I adore you so much, that I give to you my heart. And we have songs that Christians have written over this, our generation. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. And this, this aspect of the Holy Spirit in us cries out for this. Lord, we don't want to only sing songs to you. We don't want to only have good orchestration and great musicians and, and good environment and, and atmosphere. Lord, we want you to know that we are giving ourselves to you. Body, soul, and spirit, heart, as a gift. So it's adoration, and it's directed towards God. It's not directed towards a worship team, a church, or a ministry, or anything else like that. Worship is always directed, even not towards the song, but to the target of that song, which is the Lord God Almighty. The primary New Testament word for, wor for worship is proskuneo. Most of you know that in here which literally means to kiss forward. Proskuneo, the word pro, pro always means forward whenever you see that in any of the Greek language. Pros or pro means forward, like prophecy and that kind of thing. It's always forward or out into the future. And cuneo means to kiss, when you kiss someone. And it's a passionate kiss. It is not a kiss on the cheek. So this is a, one of the little flavors in the Greek language that you see in the word worship, proskuneo. It means to kiss forward, and in some cases they have found it also means to kiss the hand as if you were kissing the hand of a king. When, in those days when you would go before a king, he would extend his hand, you would either kiss his ring or you would kiss his hand, depending on who he was. Or to bow down in reverence, and honor with a complete sense of devotion and humble adoration. Devotion to the Lord means setting yourself apart for a particular person that is exclusive to all others. So I'm, when you're devoted to something, that means you are casting your vote for it. You are involved in it in such a way is that it's to the exclusion of all other candidates. So when you devote yourself in devotion, you are, you are saying to the Lord, you're the only one. You're number one. You're the target. You're my man, and I'm sticking with you. And as the um, word praise, which is kind of a little bit different, epahinos is the word here. Um, I, this morning, I, I want to kind of on purpose kind of delineate the difference between praise and worship. And I want to do that on purpose because I've been noticing, even in our congregation, that the lines are kind of blurred. And we don't really know what we are actually doing in terms of the spiritual parts of, um, of worship, what we are accomplishing in the spirit. And in worship, you accomplish a certain thing. But in praise, you accomplish a different thing. It's like the first, but it's different in, in many different ways. And the definition, obviously, of praise um, is to uh, acknowledge value. Um, like a praise means to affix value. Uh, if you have a diamond ring 
and you want to find out how much is this diamond ring worth, what do you do? You go have it appraised. And when you have it appraised, then they will, it, it fixes a value. And you say, well, I know how much this is worth. Well, that word is the same word that we use for praise here. And that word literally means to affix a value to. So when you praise the Lord, what you are doing is you are telling the Lord your appraisal of who he is in your life. How much value does he really have? How much is he worth to you is a direct reflection of your praise. Jesus said, listen, he says, if people, if, if people don't praise me, he says, these stones will rise up and praise me because the Lord is worthy of a very high value of praise. He says, the trees of the fields will clap their hands. Stones will rise up and they will give him praise. He is going to have that value. But the question is, what value do we place on him? How do you affix value to the Lord? Is he some just mystical thing in the sky that you hope that someday you're going to go to heaven because you acknowledge the fact that something was existing? Or is he a real active living person in which you are literally married to his son, you are engaged to his son, and, and the value that you're putting on him as the father and the creator of your life and the, and the, the ultimate producer of your destiny, that you put this very high value on him. Well, how he knows that is how we conduct ourselves relative to that value. If you conduct yourself, if you praise the Lord, if you ascribe value to the Lord, he says, okay, I understand that. If you don't praise the Lord and you only have an intellectual assent to the things of God, then there's something wrong with our appraisal of who he actually is. And this is one of the great values of worship. Worship is not just a bunch of songs thrown together at the beginning of a service. That's why I'm doing it at the end of the service today. On purpose. Because it's not something that is just stuck on the beginning of everybody's service in Christianity. There's something that is inherently valuable to God that lets him know what we actually value him at when we open our mouth to worship him, when we make declarations, proclamations, out of the midst of a heart the man believes, but through his mouth and his tongue he confesses unto salvations. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And what this means is that you can have everything in your heart, but until it comes out of your mouth, it actually has no power. It has no power to bring this incredible experience of salvation of Yeshua into our lives. So this is very important to understand. There are two things. Praise and worship. They both have different functions in the Lord. Matter of fact, there's a time when you cross over the line from praise into worship that is different and praise has certain values to it, which I'm going to explain today for this congregation because we are at war. We are at war. And the, one of the greatest weapons that we have, under, other than the authority in the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and our confession, is praise. Worshiping the Lord in praise. When you are at war at the level that we are, you have to understand that God has given us weapons of warfare that are not carnal in nature. They're supernatural. They're supernaturally and spiritually appraised. Once again, that word. So praise has been given to you as a key weapon to destroy demonic forces in your life. Problem is, is that everybody that, that understands that has a difficult time entering into it. Because ultimately, it's always going to wind up being a sacrifice. 
This is why the Bible teaches, I, when you bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, the key word there is not praise, it's the sacrifice of it. It's hard to do this, especially in the American culture, when everybody wants to be cool, everybody doesn't want to be embarrassed, and the church usually centers around the people instead of around the Lord. Well, the Lord is wants to restore the way it used to be, the tabernacle of David. And ultimately, we are going to enter into that place before the great end time revival. I believe with all my heart, two things are going to happen in the great end time revival, which is going to happen coincidentally with the great apostasy or the falling away of the church. Two things. Number one, revival will come in on the wings of young people. And number two, revival will come in on the wings of worship and praise. When the presence of the Lord is restored in the house of the Lord, you will know it's time. It's time. When the Holy Spirit starts walking around the building and you can feel the train of his temple, in the midst, in the context of worship, when the train of the Lord fills the temple, when God is enthroned on the praises of his people, he takes up his throne, his kingdom, in the midst of all of what is going on, you'll know it's time that the great apostasy is starting, which it already has, by the way, and the great revival is coming, which, by the way, that's already little raindrops are beginning to fall. Get prepared for that. And the way to get prepared is with the understanding of praise and worship. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. John 4.21, Jesus speaking. He said, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Speaking about God the Father. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, Numa, and in truth, Aletheia. In spirit and in truth. And listen to this line that Jesus says right after that. For such people, what kind of people? Spirit people and truth people. Such people like that, the Father seeks, he's looking for, to be his worshipers. That's who the Lord is looking for. He's looking for those Davidic people. He's not looking for the Pharisaical people and the religious people. And the overly ordered people, or I should say inordinately ordered people. He's looking for those who can worship him in the Holy Spirit and worship him in truth, in truth, and not in some kind of conjured up environment and atmosphere. I said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, this is a very clear principle. Through him then, the author of Hebrews saying this, let us continually or constantly offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips. He actually tells you what this sacrifice is. He says it's not going to come out of your head. It's going to come out of your mouth. It's something you are going to be declaring, something you're going to be singing, something you're going to be pro proclaiming. He says, it's the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name. That word Eucharistia goes way beyond thanks, but that's the word they translated that, so we'll let it go at that. So then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. And the, and the react, reality is Jewish people knew in those days that a sacrifice has to be lifted up to the Lord. When you have heave offerings, when you have loaf offerings, all the offerings are always lifted up to the Lord. That's why they call them heave 
offerings in the Old Testament. They would be lifted up literally to the Lord. They would even cut the parts of the animal, lift them up to the Lord after washing them, then burn them and sacrifice them. But one thing they really did know about this process, that any offering always costs something. It always costs either somebody's life or it costs some value. And this is important to understand in, the, in praise. Praise doesn't come cheap. There are a lot of people in this room who are so in love with the Lord that you can praise the Lord driving down the road in your car. If I snuck into your house at, uh, after lunch, you'd probably be dancing around washing dishes with, with music on. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. But not everybody does that. Not everybody praises the Lord because it's a sacrifice. And you would think, you would think, here we are in a Christian church. We are spirit-filled Christians. We are Bible-believing Christians. We go only by the Word of God. We are Christians who love the nation of Israel. You would think that with all those elements in place, that we would walk into a congregational setting knowing that we are here for the Lord and not for any other purpose, and that everything that would come out of us would be praise and worship. That there would be a fire that's so shut up in our bones that it would have to get out. Couldn't contain it. I can't hold it anymore. And this proclamation, this honor, this praise that goes up to the Lord would be resident within us. But yet, we find out that there is another force at work. The force of suppression. And this force of suppression is demonic in nature. And what this force does, and what it, it, where it comes from, it comes from Satan, obviously. Satan hates praise more than anything. Do you realize that when Satan was cast out of heaven, he was in heaven with God? Matter of fact, if you can really read between the lines, he was the senior worship leader out of all the angelic majesties that were in the kingdom of heaven. There were three major archangels. Arch means the ones who are over everything. Michael and Gabriel, of course, Michael over Israel, Gabriel over the messengers that come to the earth. But the reality is Lucifer, which his name was prior to him being cast out of heaven, Lucifer, which means clear, bright, shining one, was the head of the worship team in heaven. And he had all the timbrels and the lyres, and he had all this, this one-third of all the angels were in this group, and they would constantly worship the Lord until he fell. And when he fell, because of pride, the Lord cast him down to, heaven, to, to the earth, He's no longer in heaven. He's on the earth. One of the things now he wants to redirect is what he was in charge of. He wants God to know there will be no worship because I'm not there. The head guy is not there. The best of the best is not there. And your people can't do it. And what he tries to do is suppress the people of God from worshiping. And praising the Lord. That's his job. So if, if the average Christian person spends more time being oppressed than they do being in the context of praise and worship. That's right. More time in oppression and suppression than the freedom of worship. Why? Because we're in war. But here's the magical secret of this. We're in this war, but the very same thing that the enemy is trying to stop us from doing, which we allow him to stop us, is the, is the exact thing that the Lord has given us to defeat the enemy. Praise defeats the enemy. Praise is one of the incredible things that drives demonic forces away from you. You say, well, prayer and the blood of Jesus and the cross. I say, yes, yes, yes. That's all true. 
But when you start affixing value to the Lord, you're taking yourself out of the equation and you are calling down the forces of God into a situation and the enemy cannot hear God being honored. He hates it. Satan doesn't want to hear Jesus Christ or God in the Pledge of Allegiance. He hates hearing the name of the Lord being lifted up. And he'll stop it. He'll try to stop it. He'll use people to do it. But it's your weapon. That's your weapon to actually demise him. And when you have that spirit, you say, well, you know, I really don't have that. You know, I guess it's hard. I, you know, it's the work. You know, I come home from work. I'm tired. And then, uh, I really don't have that kind of spirit. Well, I want to tell you. I would suggest to you. The Lord already told you it's going to be a sacrifice. He said, it's a sacrifice to praise me. The whole world is trying to demise Jesus, the word, the anointed. The whole world is against the anointed. It's antichrist spirit. Of course it's going to be hard. We, we're living under a blanket of religion right here in Franklin and Spring Hill. The power of religion is all through this place and what does that do the first thing that you know that christians are <laughs> suppressed and you go in other areas which i do in other churches which i do and people are jumping up and down on their seats and the praise is blowing the roof off the building and it's blowing the air clear and there's a hole in the heavens well it's not the people it's the specific demonic forces in given locations that suppress greater than in other areas. Other areas are different problems. But in this area, the problem is suppression. And the Lord has spoken to, to us the idea that here's how you break it. Here's how you break the powers that are oppressing you. And we think it's some great magical formula. It's not. It's very simple. We just had a couple in the other night, and they were having marital problems and this, that, and the other thing, demonic attacks during the night. And Joyce and I said to them, okay, here's what you're going to do. Here's what you do. And they're thinking, oh, boy, this is going to be a, a great wise dissertation on how I'm going to fix my husband. And I, we just simply said to them, I want you to play praise music throughout your house all through the night. And all through the day, just turn it on, put it on, and then see what happens. Because in our experience, we know this. When we were dealing with in children, with a lot of children in our church, we had a young church with lots of children, and they were all kind of some of them were depressed, and some of them were couldn't sleep at night, and there were you know all kinds of problems with the kids. And we would tell the parents do, to put this music on, this praise music on. We would suggest certain things and praise music, and they would do it. And the kids would get delivered. And they would sleep right through the night like babies are supposed to sleep. And they weren't oppressed. And people say, well, why? Did you talk to the kid? The kids don't understand this. But what they do know is the presence of the Lord. And praise creates an atmosphere of the presence of the Lord that for some reason that makes the enemy run out the door. He does not like it when you are praising and worshiping God. He'll try to attack you. He'll try to stop you. And if he can't, he will run. But you can't let him go to that first phase. He's going to try to stop you, suppress you. And if you let him and you keep your mouth shut, then of course he wins, and he doesn't run, he sticks around and goes for other areas of your life. But if you persevere, and you endure, and you learn how to overcome and sacrifice, this is hard, Lord, I don't feel like praising you this morning. I don't feel like singing these songs and declaring who you are and what you are. And if you are able to overcome that, say, I'm going to praise you. I don't care if I'm bleeding from the side. I'm going to worship you. I don't care if I'm crippled, if I've got a headache. 
I'm going to worship you no matter what the situation is. I don't care if I'm in jail. I'm going to worship you. And what happens is that not only does the Lord acknowledge that, but ultimately the enemy knows that you are for real. And once he knows he's dealing with the real deal, he flees. Why? Because the Bible says, when you resist the devil, he flees. God's not chasing him away. You are resisting. That's an act that you do. And then the devil flees on the basis of that resistance. And that's how he does. And that's how that works. In Jeremiah, the 33rd verse, it says, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the... Forever. And of them that shall bring the what? The sacrifice of praise out of those who will do that into the house of the Lord, I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. In other words, the Lord's going to restore. But it's only to those that get that kind of protection. It's only to those who understand what it means to bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. As I said before, some people say, what if I don't feel the presence? I'll just say this very quickly. Worship is about 20% emotions, but it's 80%. I mean, emotions are good. You should have emotions. You should have joy, love, peace, all these emotions there that God has. But 80% of it is mental assent and the voluntary expression of your will. That's you volunteering to worship. You are overcoming and you are making a statement. Lord, I'm going to worship you. I don't care if the cows come home. I'm going to worship you. Now, one thing I want to touch on, uh, this didn't come out very good, but if in your Bibles, if you can turn to Psalm 149, verse 1 through 9, I want to touch on uh, a couple of things here. This obviously is in the, in the Hebrew language, written in, in the book of Psalms. It's, it's next to the last Psalm. Psalm 150 talks exclusively about praising the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him in his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpets. Tra praise him with harps and lyres. Praise him with timbrels and dancing. Praise, praise, praise him with stringed instruments. That means Fender Stratocasters. And pipes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with loud resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Using the word halal. Praise the Lord. Everything that can even move or breathe. I find it very interesting. It is the very last thing that is written in the incredible book of Psalms. The incredible book of Psalms, the very last thing that has been written, which is important that he ends with praise, 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 praise. Now in Psalm 149, one Psalm above that, let's just examine something real quick here. There are certain words, there are nine words here that are used for, for, for praise, for, for a methodology of praising. And I kind of want you to see that. So in Psalm 149, uh, if you can't read that screen, I'll, out of the Bible, it says, Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrels and lyres. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. And let the high praises of God be in their mouth 
and a two-edged sword in their hand. Interesting picture there. Verse 7, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on peoples to bind their kings, these errant nations, with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the judgment that is written. This is actually an honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. I know it's hard to read that, but that's what it says in Psalm 149. There is a litany of nine different types of ways that we praise the Lord in Psalm 149. I want to very quickly show you this so that when next time you praise the Lord, which hopefully is today, that you will start to internalize this and start driving the enemy out of your life instead of allowing him back in to your life, which we all really need to do. The first one is uh, in, in the first verse, obviously. It says, praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the godly one. The first word that is used there is the word hallel. Hallel means literally to shine, hence to make a show, to boast, and thus be clamorously foolish, <laughs> to rave, to causatively, to celebrate, to commend, to make foolish, to glory, to sing, be worthy of praise. Now that's kind of an interesting word for Hallel. Because the word hallelujah comes out of that, and we say that all the time. But the reality is, saying it is not actually doing it. Part of doing it is literally to shine, to boast on the Lord. How many of you know that pride is a sin, but it's okay to be proud of God? That's right. That's absolutely true. How many of you know that boasting is a sin, but the Bible says you can boast in the Lord? That's right. You can boast in the Lord. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you should be walking around town saying, Jesus Christ is my hero. He's a real man. He's the one I follow. You boast in him. He can do anything. It's like when you're a kid boasting about your dad. I remember when I was a little boy, I thought my dad was the, I thought he could beat the United States Army up. I thought he could beat every dad up on the block. I thought he, he knew absolutely everything. You can do nothing wrong. He was all powerful. He would say something and it would get done. I mean, just I, that's the way I was brought up. But you know what? When you are converted into the faith, you come under a new fatherhood. And in that fatherhood, there's some element of halal that we have to possess. And that element is to boast, to make a show, to be clamorously foolish about the Lord. And he says, this is number one, praise the Lord. Whenever you see that in the Bible now, I want you to think about that. It means to be clamorously foolish and boastful about God, to make a show. Then he says, sing to the Lord a new song. That word is kodesh, not kodesh. Kodesh means holy. This is kadosh, and it means fresh, a new thing as in freshly baked bread. So when he says, sing to the Lord a new song, the Lord wants something from us that obviously is not stale. That's not the same old rehashed meal that was prepared. You know, the difference between when you're eating, and I'm an, I'm an Italian, I love bread, but I will tell you one thing, there's a whole bunch of difference between old, stale Italian bread and one that f just came right out of the oven that day. There's a big difference between the two of those when you're eating a meal. And in the context of worshiping God, God says, I want you to bring me a new song. I want you to bring me something fresh, something that just came out of the oven. Kadash. And... Thirdly, in this one verse, he says, and his praise, now he uses the word tehillah. 
The first word was Hallel, but he doesn't use the same word the second time. The second time, he uses the word Tehillah. And Tehillah is an interesting concept. Tehillah is the rhema word of the Lord. It's the rhema, spoken praises, the word confessed in song. That's kind of interesting. Because sometimes you have to do that in the spirit. Sometimes you're not going to have the words on the screen to a Tahila song in your life. It's the rhema, spoken praises of the Lord. That's what comes for the moment. And we should be ready to be singing the praises of the Lord, not only in Hallel, but also in Tahila, which is the rhema of the Lord, the one that comes instantaneously. You know, when you're driving down the street in your car you, and you just came back from the office and somebody just blessed you and, and, and some business deal went through or something happened good, the doctor report came back good, and you start singing a song to the Lord, but it has really no words that were ever published by anybody. That you are thankful to the Lord, and Lord, this was great, and you really knocked them out today, Lord, and all the things that you really are for the moment being led by the Spirit to confess and to bless the Lord with. That is the spirit of Tehillah, and the Lord wants that out of us too. It says in the next verse, let Israel be glad, Samach. Some words is Sameach, in his master, or in his maker, let the sons of Zion rejoice. That word gil is there. This word samach, he says, let Israel rejoice or be glad, be glad, be happy. This word samach means, it's a primitive root word, it means to brighten up. Be gleesome or to make radiant as we are being delivered. To be radiant in the Lord. Brighten up. And this to me, and when I was taught this many, many years ago, this to me helped me out because I was a very serious young man when I was growing up and I hardly ever laughed any, anymore. And then the Lord started dealing with me about the idea of brightening up. Change your countenance. You're a Christian. Things are going to be good for you. Brighten up. And he says, let Israel brighten up in their maker. So when you worship the Lord, Rather than looking like you just ate a barrel of dill pickles with lemon juice on the side for a chaser, rather than having that look, there's something about you that is bright because of the light that is in you, that the joy of the Lord truly is resident within each and every one of us. Brighten up. Then he says, let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. This word gil, it's, by, it's a permutated word, but the word gil, it means to spin around under the influ influence of any violent emotion, to spin like a top. Y'all remember the revival that took place about 10 years ago? There was a revival that went blasted through Florida. It was in our church as well. I remember being uh, in the Tampa at a, at a meeting in Tampa, and there was about um, 2,000 pastors at this meeting, and I was sitting in the front row, and right next to me there was like a 95-year-old pastor. He, if he was a day, he was 90. I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was. And I'm sitting there with all my pastors, and this meeting was going on, and the Holy Spirit just was waving over everybody. People were falling on the floor laughing, and it was just incredible demonstration of power. And then all of a sudden... I look over, this man, this 90-year-old guy, jumps up in the air into the aisle, and I'm sitting next to him, so I kind of go like this because I didn't know, here we have a terrorist attack in the middle of the church, right? He jumps up, and then all of a sudden, and I will never forget this, you can ask Ben Green, those of you who know him, he was sitting right next to me, we were like, this is not happening. He jumps up in the air, and he starts spinning. He started spinning around in one spot, so fast, we couldn't discern what his features were. He was like a blur. He was spinning around in the spirit. And when he was doing that, the Lord recalled this to me. Psalm 149, Gil. He was spinning around like a top. 
And it's a funny thing I have watched over the years in, in the context of worship in the presence of the Lord that when sometimes when the, when the anointing for that begins to happen, I see people spinning around in the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Sometimes they dance and sometimes they spin around in the Lord. There's something about spinning around in the Lord that is like the whirlwind of the Lord in your life that does incredible things. And he says, let Zion, let the sons of Zion spin around like a top in their king. And I want to submit to you that you are a son of Zion. This is not for an Old Testament person. You are part of the sons of Zion. We all are in this room, especially. Something about spinning. If you've never spun in the Lord, go home and try it first. Put on your worship music. Put on your praise music. Take off the Rolling Stones. Put on praise and worship music and see what the Lord does with you and see if the whirlwind of the Lord doesn't come into your house. Also, the next verse, verse 3 says, Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing his praises to him with timbrel and lyre. This word dancing is makol. And makol is a round circle dance. It also means a parade, not like Joshua did around Jericho. What Joshua did around Jericho was called makol. It was a orchestrated circle dance around a particular problem that the Lord needed to solve. There is a great place in the body of Christ for dancing. Most of the churches that you find in central Tennessee will not you allow you to dance in the church at all. In this church, I say you can dance anytime you want to. As a matter of fact, if you want to dance on top of the chairs, be my guest. And there's a place, not only for spinning around like a top, but there's a place where you can get in a circle. And many times in congregational worship, you see a circle dance where all of a sudden everybody's grabbing hands and they're going around in a circle. You say, well, where did all that come from? That actually came from King David, not from Hebrew dancing school. This came from the Word of God. And what it does, it encircles the, the problems that you are facing, and it causes walls to collapse. We don't do enough dancing. This, he also says, let them praise, sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. He uses this word zamar. Zamar is a, um, also a primitive root word. Um, th through the idea of striking with the fingers, um, properly to touch the strings, parts of a musical instrument. This is what Charles and Tommy and our guitarists, they, this is what they do. They are in, they're worshiping in Zamar. Touching the parts of a musical instrument by striking it with your fingers, playing upon it to make music accompanied by the voice in some cases. Hence, to celebrate in song and in music. Musicians were commanded to prophesy on their instruments in 1 Chronicles 25. Do you realize the fact that when God puts a musical instrument in your hand, that it becomes part and parcel of you, and that you can prophesy on the instruments? Matter of fact, they can be so powerful, they can drive demonic forces away from you. When Saul was oppressed by demons, what did David do? Did he look for a conference to go to? No. He picked up his harp, and he started to strike his harp with his fingers. And what happened to the demons around Saul? Who remembers? They went away. They got driven away because of the playing of this musical instrument in the spirit of the Lord. This is classic, that whenever you hear, this is why we allow for so much diversity, the banging of the keyboards, the banging of the drums, the striking of instruments and tambourines and uh, djembes and all the rest of this stuff we have up there, the, the string guitars, the 12-string guitars, all these things, these are weapons of war in the hands of the people of God. It's very important to know that. 
I'm coming to a close here. There's only, only two more verses left. He says, then in the next verse, he says, let the godly ones exult in glory. That word is all as or ahaz. Both are found in there. Let them sing for joy on their beds. This word uh, ahaz literally means to jump for joy, to exult. When he says exult, he means to jump for joy, to be joyful, to rejoice, to triumph, to leap, leaving the ground. How many of you know that Jesus of Nazareth did this? That the Spirit overcame him in such a way that he leapt. The Greek word is agaleo, but the Hebrew word is ahaz. And Jesus literally left his feet leaping for joy in the Spirit of the Lord. And one of the things that when you're worshiping the Lord, one of the weapons that you have is jumping up and down. Now, you see this very commonly in revival because it's so prevalent. It's, it's not hard to sacrifice. When revival is in the midst of you, you can jump up and down all the time. We used to do that. We, we, we used to call it the pogo stick. And people would just, we would watch people bouncing all over the place. It was phenomenal type of thing. But it says, let godly people jump that way, exalt that way, it has, in glory. You know, when, when your team makes a touchdown, I watch this because I'm a, I'm a sports nut growing up. I would watch. Whenever somebody would, would shoot a three-point jump shot and win a game, or some guy would run over uh, the right tackle and score a touchdown as the clock was going out and beat the other team by six points or something, you would see the people in the crowds, they would just jump up off their seats. Everybody leaving the ground, yay! Well, the reality is, is that we have a greater victory in God than they could ever have in the Miami Dolphins. And when's the last time we jumped up in the air, Ahaz, and leapt in exultation over the victory of the Lord in our life? I know the Lord's made victories in our lives in a hundred different areas. But usually we won't even say thank you, let alone jump out of our seat. The last one, and maybe the most important for this congregation, is um, this thing called the high praises. And David, for some reason, leaves this for last. Out of the nine things, he leaves Romena, or Romema, depending on how you want to pronounce it, for last. He said, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. This word, romema, is um, high praises. It means to mount up. It is the ninth level of praise and spiritual warfare. Now, what we see in this is in the following verses, right after this verse 6 where he says this, let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Very important that it's in your mouth and not in, only in your heart and your head, but in your mouth. He says, to why? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. Do you know what that means? in translated spiritual language. When you are able to literally bind kings with chains, what that is speaking of is principalities and powers can be bound when there's the sword, the two-edged sword, in the mouth of he who praises. So when you are praising the Lord, you have the two-edged sword in your possession. It's in your hand. You own it. And when, what you have there is the power to literally demise the enemy. Put him in his place. When you praise, you bind kings. Some of you, I'm going to dare to say this, don't get mad at me, don't throw tomatoes. Some of you have principalities operating in your life. They are such strong strongholds that it's difficult to overcome, and some of them have been there for decades. How do you unwind yourself from that? 
How do you defeat that? Well, most people start trying to read books and go into seminars, but that's not the way. The first way is romema, the high praises of God in your mouth with the two-edged sword in your hands that gives you the power to bind these kings. And then, the next verse, after you bind the kings, and then you can bind their nobles with fetters of iron. Who, what, who are the nobles? The kings are the principalities. The nobles are the demons. They're the second in control. They're the nobles of the dark kingdom, so to speak. How many of you realize the fact that you can actually imprison them instead of them imprisoning you? But the mechanism that releases that in us is praise and high praise in our mouth. So the next time that you are kind of under it, you're under the table, you're getting smashed from every corner, you're being oppressed by everything, rather than going out and getting ice cream or some comfort food or whatever else, begin to sacrifice, begin to overcome, and begin to release praise from your mouth. And this is critical. It comes from your mouth. It's one of the great dangers, by the way, of having a great worship team, by the way, which we have in this congregation, incredible amount of talent. But it's a danger as well as a blessing. What's the danger? That they're so good that all you want to do is listen. I find myself, as Charles starts playing that lead guitar, uh, all I want to do is listen to that. I, want to, I just want to hear that, that spiritual sound. And you know what? You have to be careful that you are not only observing, but you are participating in what the Lord is doing. So that little guitar rift, instead of being said, boy, that's really sounded good, rather than that appealing to your nature, what you have to internalize, what you have to say is that, Lord, I follow, and I'm trying to hear what you're saying in that. Because most musicians that are called musicians, which we have a bunch, prophesy through their instruments and don't play them. They prophesy through their instruments and they don't play them. Now, people in the world, they play their instruments. That's their deal. They play it. It's good. It sounds good. What does it sound good to? The flesh. Right? Beatles, Rolling Stones, whatever. It sounds good to the flesh. Barbara Streisand. The flesh. But reality is that when this music is played here, something is going on in the spirit that is being prophesied to you, whether they are saying words or not has no bearing on the case. Whether, they, whether words come out of somebody's mouth is not that important. It's what's happening in the spiritual transaction in the spirit realm. And this is very important to understand because God is restoring the tabernacle of David. Psalm 149 is how he really wants worship to be, not like the contemporary modern music scene is dictating that it should be. Can you all understand your responsibility in that this morning? It's very important that we become a church of praise. Now, we didn't even touch worship this morning, by the way. That's for another day. We didn't even go into the Holy of Holies to find out what happens there. But just from the outer court's perspective, look what happens when you praise the Lord and you brighten up and you start making a fool of yourself for the Lord. All of a sudden, all your demons get cast away. And they have to run. They hate the light. And they hate worship with a passion. So I'm going to ask you right now just to stand up for a moment. Unfortunately, I have not even touched on, this, on, on the reality of what the Bible teaches about praise, but that'll have to be good enough for today uh, as the Lord kind of moves us forward in our new uh, kind of format in, in praise and worship, which I feel like the Lord really wants us to do. If you just bow your head, I just want to pray one simple prayer uh, over you. I'm going to call up uh, uh, the, the guys here in, in a minute here. 
Thank you, Father. Just want to ask you just to take a little reevaluation of where you are at in the Lord when it comes to valuing and then verbalizing that value to the Lord. In other words, confessing that value to the Lord. Father in heaven, as Lord, as we take stock of your word, we measure ourselves against your word, not against worldly standards. Lord, we can care less how we sound against other churches and secular music. Lord, all we want to do is we want to praise your name. And Lord, we want to be able to fulfill our destiny by putting the proper value on who you are in our life. And Lord, this morning we repent. Lord, if we have been overcome rather than been overcomers, we ask you, Lord, to forgive us because it's in our heart because of our love for you that we want to be obedient to your word. We want to praise you. We want to honor you. We want to sing, Lord, from the top of our lungs that there's nobody like your son because we know it in our mind. But Lord, this cloud of oppression has taken a toll. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak to this cloud, this thing which has kept us in a bottle, put a blanket over our shoulders and over our head, has shut our mouths when we know in our heart that we love you. We know, Lord, that we would jump out of our seats if you entered the room. But Lord, we've been tricked by an enemy that is deceitful and cunning. And Lord, we have let oppression and depression, frustration, be dominant in our life. When Lord, the key to freedom is in praising your name, making proclamation and declaration to who you are and throwing ourselves like fools, Lord, at your feet. So this morning, Lord, we ask for forgiveness, and we ask for a fresh start. Lord, we bind the fear of man in the name of Jesus Christ, the fear of embarrassment, the fear of looking like a fool when we were born to be fools. In the name of Jesus, we ask, O oh Lord, that you take this fear away from us. Lord, what is it if we care what anyone says about us when we worship you? What is it? We only care about what you say and what you think when we worship you. So why are we so afraid, oh God? We have let the enemy steal and rob us from the incredible power to defeat him. And Lord, today we reverse that curse in the name of Jesus, that our households may become flowing with rivers of living water, that we would live in the land of milk and honey that you told us, Lord, that we were destined to live in. That is not a lie. That is not a tease. But Lord, we have held ourselves out at the gate, and now we shed those old garments that we might enter in to a new land of prosperity in every aspect of our being. Freedom, prosperity, and goodness. We honor you, Lord. We bless your holy name. And today, O oh Lord, let it be the day of a new beginning for all of us that we will praise the Lord and all that it means. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, Mark, come on up here, if you will. Y'all can uh, have a seat for a moment. We're going to do a couple things here. Um, we're going to bless the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings. Mark will take care of that. And then directly after that, don't go home. Why don't you stay here for a little bit? I'm just going to put some music on over the system that we have. I want you to, to listen to what's being played. And then rather than just listening to it, I want you to get behind it and get in it and go up to the Lord 
and praise his name this morning. Before any of you leave here today, do this experiment. Test yourself in this. Praise the Lord this morning. Value his name. Sing something to him this morning. And forget about the person that's next to you, as if they weren't, weren't even here. Just separate yourself out. Make this your closet this morning, if you can do that. This is your closet. You and the Lord. There'll be many behind you. But let it be you and the Lord. And worship him and praise him. Especially praise this morning. Praise the Lord this morning. And see if things don't start turning around. And if you do it long enough, here's what I'll tell you. Here's the promise. You do this long enough and your oppression will leave you today. It'll leave you today. It'll just be blown out the window as he flees from you. So, Mark, if you lead us. Uh, if the ushers would please come forward. Uh, folks, we as a body have operated an outreach here to the community with this preschool academy. And we've reached, what, 50, 60, 70 families a year uh, through that. And this 4th of July event, is of course our main opportunity to outreach to hundreds of families. Now, this is a major undertaking and it's a major financial commitment to pull this off. We would ask that you please uh, remember that in your giving. Uh, it's not an inexpensive activity. So if you would keep that in mind, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, now, if, if you would bow your heads, we'll pray over this morning's offering. Uh, Father God, you appointed each of us to be alive at this season in the history of mankind. It is an honor and it is a privilege to be able to help finance your kingdom at this moment in time. We ask that you receive these gifts from us, given in worship, given to your glory. Magnify them and make it be a very effective method of spreading your kingdom throughout the people of this region. Father, our money represents what you first gave us. You gave us time on this earth. You gave us talents. You gave each of us strengths. We are all unique in those regards. And our money is an opportunity for us to return portions of those blessings you gave us back to you. Honor the givers this morning, Lord, we ask. Bless each of our families, and we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Guys, if you go forward, and now we will move into our praise and worship portion. George. Um, I just want to um, make an announcement about the, uh, the upcoming 4th of July thing that we're having. It's really, really important that you all sign up today because next Sunday is the day before the 4th of July and we need to have everybody lined up for what they're going to be doing out on the property. And um, if you can just, as you're going out the door, there's a, like Carrie said, there's a little table over there. It's got all the uh, lists on it. You can just sign up for it. And um, we would really appreciate that so we can move forward on this. Okay, before we um, uh, start our, the, uh, the, the praise part, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet for one moment, if you will. If you can kind of picture this in your mind, this is not a law but this is like a picture. It's like a metaphor. Praise is like standing as worship is like sitting as you sit at the feet of the Lord. Praise is like standing, very proactive, very powerful, very dynamic. And worship is like sitting, like you sit with the Lord on his lap or at his feet. So when we praise the Lord, especially on Sunday mornings, we're going to ask that you begin to stand in the praise parts, and you can kind of sit, or you can do anything you really want. I mean, I don't even care if you come up to the altar and lay down on the altar, or if you come up here, and I don't, it, I don't care what you do. 
as long as you're worshiping the Lord and praising the Lord. So you try to um, enjoin that, that picture in your spirit. Man, that praise is something that you want to stand up, and you are literally almost in an attack mode against the kingdom of darkness as you are elevating the kingdom of light. So sometimes, you know, it's hard to um, have a sword fight when you're sitting down, if you can follow that analogy. Now, I want you to, uh, if you will, kindly to engage me in a little foolishness this morning. Okay? If you are a foolish person, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, which automatically makes you foolish, at least makes you peculiar, a peculiar generation, I'm going to ask you um, to find the one that you love in your heart right now. Find the person that you love in your heart right now, but it can't be a natural person. It can't be your husband or your wife. It can be the person that you gave your life to, though. Okay? And you find out the person that you've given your life to, that you really love, that you honor, that you would be literally willing to die for in your life. And I'm going to ask you, when I count to three, I want you to, to at the top of your lungs... I want you to shout out the name of that person with everything that you have, with everything that has breath or your deepest breath. And several things will happen at that point in time. Number one, it's part of the testimony of breaking the fear of man. But number two, and probably more importantly, you're going to find out that the enemy hates this name and he hates you proclaiming it. And then on top of that, he hates you proclaiming it at the top of your lungs. And if you do it and you really mean it, what he has to do, he says, I'm going to go find another Christian who won't do that. I'll find somebody else. I am not going to be hanging around no Christians that are shouting out the name of their Lord. I'm not going to be hanging around those kinds of people. And what happens is this is part of your resistance. And it breaks something in the heavens. It's funny on earth, the great opera stars, they say, if you take some fine china and you put it out in front of them and they hit a note, they can actually break the glass with the power and the vibration of their voice, indicating that the voice has power. In the spirit realm, it's just like that. Whatever you say will occur. You have the power of life and death in your tongue and in your confession. And something needs to break in your life. And rather than just walking around the wall and shouting, we want to walk around that wall today in the spirit, and we want to shout the name of Jesus who is the destroyer of all yokes. He destroys them all, and he has the power to do that. So on the count of three, and then we'll start our worship, and then you can, then your pastor will leave you alone for a while. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Jesus! That's not quite loud enough. I want some of those demons that are in the corner up there and a couple of them that are over the building to hear exactly what we are saying today, exactly who we are representing, exactly who we are ambassadors are of in this place, Spring Hill, Tennessee. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus! Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Stephen, let's worship the Lord.
We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We come to pray.